Okay, so what can you do if you do not hear as well as you should, or maybe not as well as you used to? Um, the basic tool we have we have to deal with this, uh, which you probably already know about, um, are hearing aids. Uh, so generally speaking, a hearing aid is basically an amplifier. Uh, so it makes the sounds that you hear louder before they go into your ear. Um, so in terms of the old style hearing aids um, that people have used for many years, uh, they would basically amplify all frequencies. Uh, in the modern day, uh, they can kind of tweak that a bit according to sort of your audiogram profile and amplify specific frequencies maybe based on a listener's particular hearing capabilities. But still, it's basically an external system which is making things louder so that hopefully you can pick up um, better what's being said to you or what you're hearing in the world around you. Um, so that's cool uh, and it does help. Um, it's not particularly sophisticated, although the more we learn, the more we, uh, we can do with that sort of system. Um, more recently, within the past few decades or so, uh, profoundly deaf listeners can regain some hearing through the use of what's called a cochlear implant. Uh, and so this is for listeners who have not just had kind of like a general hearing loss as they age over time or what have you, but for listeners who have uh, nerve deafness and their cochleas in their inner ears are simply not working uh, in the way that they're supposed to. Maybe they've been damaged or something else has gone wrong through them. Uh, you can lose hearing, for instance, through um, a bout of meningitis, for instance, which is uh, inflammation of the uh, or an infection of the uh, meninges which surround your brain. Um, so. If something like that happens, or maybe even if you've been born um, deaf, you can use a cochlear implant to acquire or regain the sense of hearing. Uh, and this is a much more involved um, intervention than simply giving somebody a hearing aid uh, because it is actually um, an implant that you put in your body and it remains um, in the system uh, with a connection to the outside world in order to be able to get to work. Uh, but you can't just take it in or, or out. Um, so the issue with these, uh, which, um, so they're interesting to find out how these things actually work. Uh, and one of the interesting parts of them is that they don't give you an exact representation of hearing in the way that we normally get it because they're mechanical or electromechanical devices, right? They can't do exactly the same things that our bodies do. Uh, so they transmit a degraded signal to the inner ear, which, uh, can be useful and helpful, but is not exactly the same thing as human beings are normally used to listening to. Um, so, like I said, the cochlear implant is literally implanted inside your cochlea. That's where it gets its name. Uh, and it consists of multiple parts here, and I'll kind of walk you through them here. Uh, and then I've got another listing of them on the next slide. Uh, but the implant, uh, there's a part of it, uh, which I believe uh, has a magnet in it, uh, in the skull here. And then it's linked through an electrical connection to an electrode array, which uh, they try to circle in as far as they can into the cochlea itself. So the electrode array, uh, it, as it's described here, is a wire bundle uh, with um, sort of different channels of electrodes, which are kind of uh, tuned or, well, they line up with different parts of your cochlea uh, from the base, not quite to the apex here. Um, so basically the idea, well, yeah, so that's sort of the mechanical part of the inside um, that gets implanted into your head. On the outside, there is a microphone, which uh, can make a connection here with the uh, implant part. Uh, and that is also connected by a cable uh, to a speech processor, which you can like wear around your, your belt. Um, and so the microphone will pick up sound waves uh, and that will be transmitted to the speech processor, which can take those sound waves and kind of um, manipulate them in any sort of digital way that we're used to manipulating sound waves, like in PROT or in a computer in general. It will send a signal back to this headpiece, which will transmit those ma manipulated sound waves to the implant, um, which uh, will then transmit them by electricity to these electrodes. Uh, and then they will kind of activate these different parts of the cochlea. So each electro will uh, kind of fire in the same way that like hair cells would have fired in a um, normally functioning cochlea. Uh, so that will transmit some electrical signal through the auditory nerve to the brain. Um, so it's bypassing this whole system of going through the ear canal and the ossicles and all that sort of thing uh, and still getting an electrical signal to go into the nervous system. So isn't that amazing?
um, that people can do this and they can regain some sense of hearing if they have lost it. Uh, so this walks you through those three um, uh, steps in the process. So there's a microphone which picks up the sounds in the world around the listener's head. Uh, it goes through the speech processor. And I'll mention at this point um, that at the speech processor can be modified in terms of how it works. Uh, so that can be kind of continually. So first of all, it kind of creates a reality for the user of the system. Um, it structures the environmental events that are going into their head before they hear them. Um, and that part of the system can be updated in the same way that you like update the software on your computer or on your phone or something like that. Uh, so once people come up with better sort of processing algorithms to enable people to hear things better, they can sort of just update the software and the whole system will work better. Even though the implants, they're basically permanently inside your head. They can um, tweak with the external parts if they want to. Uh, and then the speech processor just uh, sends those signals to the implant on the inside of a user's head and that will stimulate the cochlea uh, in order to enable the user to hear. Um, like I said, what the CI user hears is determined by the code in the speech processor. The number of electrodes that stimulate the cochlea range between 8 and 22, uh, at least. So I used to work in a lab where a lot of research was done on cochlear implants, uh, and that was the case back in those days. I haven't, I should check up on this to make sure it still is that, uh, but it, it's possible that um, these systems may have improved uh, in the last few years. But either way, uh, with this amount of electrodes, um, you're going to get poorer frequency resolution than you would get with uh, sort of your natural hearing system. We don't have 3,500 different hair cells lined up to respond to different frequencies at different rates. Instead, there are simply just 8 to 22 different electrodes, each of which uh, has to correspond to some range of frequencies that are coming to it from the speech processor uh, on the outside of the listener's head. Also, something which is important is the cochlear implants cannot stimulate the low frequency regions of the auditory nerve. Uh, so just because of um, biomechanical reasons and uh, how these systems are designed, they can't really coil it in there as tightly uh, as they need to to get the electrodes all the way into the apex of the cochlea. So these regions just kind of remain unstimulated uh, with this sort of system. So we're able to kind of stimulate the parts of the cochlea that respond better to the higher frequencies. Uh, and we do it with worse frequency resolution. So rather than having 3,500 electrodes lined up in this array, uh, we have eight or 22, and they only go a certain amount um, of distance into the cochlea. So those low frequency parts of the cochlea or the parts of the cochlea that are used to listening to low frequencies are not going to get any information. Okay, so frequency, uh, information is not going to be represented as well as it should be in this system and listeners basically kind of have to learn how to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> the speech processor itself, one way to do it is to have it operate like a series of critical bands as we think the auditory system works anyways. Uh, so it divides up the frequency scale into like eight bands if there's eight electrodes in the array or maybe 22 bands if there's 22 electrodes in the array. Uh, and then it will stimulate each electrode according to the average intensity in each band. So sort of like if you take this range of frequencies as a critical band and say average over all of this intensity at any particular point in time, and then that, then that average intensity determines how much um, electrical signal you're sending to that electrode in the cochlear implant um, inside the, the listener's cochlea. Uh, so more intensity is more stimulation, but again, uh, because you're having to average over all these frequencies, you're not getting really great frequency information at any one particular point in time. Uh, so this is going to result uh, in what sounds to us, who, people aren't using this system, like a highly degraded version of natural speech. Um, so I've got some, like I said, I used to work in a lab where people study this, and they developed um, a cochlear implant simulator, which is based on this no uh, noise vocoding method. Um, the uh, yeah, I've got a sample of vocoding um, from music. Uh, yeah, from the band Daft Punk. I'm running out of light here, though, so I think I'm going to save that for next time. Um, this is not going to sound like music or Daft Punk. It's going to sound different because it's uh, vocoded where uh, you're averaging the intensity across different ranges of frequencies. 
Uh, and then it's also uh, noise generated. So the source of the sound here is noise, which is just kind of filtered in different shapes at different frequencies. Um, so uh, the interesting part of this is though, this is supposed to be sort of like what a cochlear, uh, cochlear implant user might hear. Um, but I think the noise part of it makes it sound not like uh, periodic human speech so much. But either way, uh, because of the uh, variations in frequency and intensity, you can still get sort of the perceptive speech out of it. These are nursery rhymes. They've been converted. Um, you can listen to them and maybe you can figure out what's being said in each one of them. Yeah, here we go. Number one. Sorry. Yeah, so that um, might sound a little odd or not immediately understandable. Uh, so I'll give you another shot at it before I play you the natural version of it. So here's the original. It's a nursery rhyme again. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such a sport and the dish ran away with a spoon. Yeah, uh, so you can get kind of the rhythm out of that. That might be, not be the most common nursery rhyme that you remember from childhood or wherever. Here's another one. Um, now that you kind of have a sense of how this works, this one might be a little bit easier. Yeah, so I'm not going to play that one twice because I think that one is easier. It's... Uh, Humpty, Humpty Dumpty. Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Yeah, and one more for fun. Yeah, so that is Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Yep. Uh, so that's one simulation of what this might sound like to someone who uses the system. It's an open question about how much sort of fundamental frequency information they can get because uh, those lower frequency regions of the cochlea simply aren't going to be able to be stimulated by um, a cochlear implant. Uh, so whether it sounds like noise to them or simply like higher frequency speech with formants, it's, it's hard to say. Um, so like I said, one thing that's missing from that vocoded speech is F0. It encodes spectral change better. So the first year I was a professor here, I had an honor student, uh, his name was Aaron Burns, um, who was interested in this um, sort of line of research. Uh, and he actually has gone on to be I think he's a spe ether speech pathologist. Actually, I think he's an audiologist, so it was a very fitting sort of thesis for him to do. Um, so he uh, put together an experiment testing intonation perception in cochlear implant simulated speech for his honors thesis. So we got a cochlear implant simulator, which sounds um, sort of like the one you just heard, but uh, it actually has periodic vibrations as a source signal for it. So it maybe sounds a little bit more like uh, natural speech. Um, and what he wanted to find out is whether a cochlear implant user versus people listening to cochlear implant simulated speech could discriminate between questions and statements. So like how much F0 information can you get out of this um, kind of speech <clears throat> to uh, hear the intonation content of it. Uh, and he also looked at whether or not people could identify the most prominent word in a sentence. Um, so I've got some samples here. Uh, he did this with either eight channel simulation or 22 channel simulation. So he played these stimuli to listeners in a listening experiment. Uh, and then he also played the unedited stimuli in a um, experiment with one cochlear implant user he was able to find through an internship he had um, through an audiologist. Uh, so here is what these sound like. Um, I think I've got the originals here. I'm worried my barley will never grow. I'm worried my barley will never grow. Yeah, so these are different statements, right? I'm worried my barley will never grow. Uh, and questions. I'm worried my barley will never grow. Uh, and the question is which one of the words, if it's a question, there are gonna be different words which are being questioned as it were. So you have to identify not only is it a question or statement, but also what's the most prominent word in the sentence. 
So we can give this a try. You can let me know how well you do. And there's this one. Is that a question or a statement? Mm, that one sounded like a question. Uh, yeah, so we can, I think these are lined up in the same way for the 22 channel simulation. They might be easier in this case. I'm worried my barley will never grow. So that one maybe sounds more like a question than this one. I'm worried my barley will never grow. And this one. I'm worried my barley will never grow. I'm worried my barley will never grow. I'm worried my barley will never grow. Yeah, I don't think I had those quite lined up. Um, but the first one was supposed to be questioning barley, I think. I'm worried my barley will never grow. And this is supposed to be a statement. I'm worried my barley will never grow. This is supposed to question grow. I'm worried my barley will never grow. And this is supposed to question I'm. I'm worried my barley will never grow. So yeah, you can kind of get that, right? And it helps when you get a little bit of feedback and some practice too. Um, I can show you the brief results from what he found. Uh, the CI user that he worked with had um, excellent, excellent identification of the most prominent word, but was at chance when distinguishing between statements and questions. Uh, so that user was not really getting that um, F0 information through the implant, uh, evidently. Uh, when he looked at what the normal hearing listeners did, they were doing pretty well, 90 to 95% correct when identifying the most prominent word in each utterance. Um, and then kind of not too shabby, like 75% at distinguishing between statements and questions. So they were doing better than the CI user uh, when it came to the intonation part of the task or the statement and question discrimination part of the task. Uh, and not almost as well. Um, at identifying the prominent word, which is also an intonation kind of task, um, but not in exactly the same way. Either way, it seems like through this um, simulation, people were getting sort of more information that was relevant to statements and questions than the CI user. So S0 information probably doesn't get through the cochlear implant very well at all, uh, because if this person has been using it for quite some time, they've uh, probably become relatively expert at it. Uh, and if they still can't get any information um, in this uh, domain, it's probably not there for them to use. Um, also, that sort of noise vocoded speech might not be the most accurate CI simulation, um, but it gives us kind of an idea of what the speech processor is doing when it um, transmits that auditory or acoustic information to the, the user. Um, yeah, so the amount of success that cochlear implants, um, that users of cochlear implants have is Variable, I said before that the person who had been using it was probably an expert user, or at least as good as they can get <coughs> if they've been using it for some time. Uh, but it works better for some people than it does for others. So I don't know exactly how that particular user lined up among the great spectrum of um, cochlear implant um, uh, patients. So uh, it tends to work best for people who have had hearing before they became deaf. So perhaps the most famous um, user of a cochlear implant for better or for worse is the radio personality Rush Limbaugh, who uh, after many years of speaking on the radio, uh, eventually started going deaf. Uh, and they relatively quickly uh, got him a cochlear implant so that he can go on and still do his thing, uh, speaking on the radio and understanding what people have to say. Uh, and when you listen to him speak, it doesn't seem to have had much of an effect on his speech at all. Uh, I don't know exactly how well he feels like he hears, but um, it's enabled him to go on and live basically, um, well, I don't know if Rush Limbaugh's life is a normal life, but it's the life he wants to lead. Uh, so he can do that. Um, so when you have had hearing before you get the implant, it's easier for you to sort of make that transition. It's possible, however, um, to implant these in people who are born deaf uh, or without much hearing at all. Uh, but again, it depends a lot on the person who's using it. Uh, possibly what's going on here is that when you lose hearing, your brain starts to reorganize a bit. If it's not using those uh, auditory portions of um, the brain as much as it used to, it might start sort of uh, calling, colonizing those uh, parts of the cortex for other purposes. Uh, and the longer it does that, the harder it is to kind of recover and go back to hearing uh, over time. Um, generally speaking, if someone does have a cochlear implant uh, and if they have not had hearing before it, uh, or maybe have um, not had hearing for a long time, uh, they can generally speaking get environmental sounds, the identification of environmental sounds out of them. Uh, it's a little funny how that works. So uh, generally speaking um, in the US, like 
where I was doing this research in Indiana uh, or working with people who did this research, I wasn't doing it so much, uh, but um, they uh, would implant one ear with a cochlear implant. Uh, so it's expensive to do this. In the US, you have to pay to have it done or have your insurance cover it to some extent. Um, one would think that uh, you'd want to implant both ears with cochlear implants to kind of get the best effect of it. Uh, but generally speaking, what they'll do is they'll take the ear that which has the most hearing loss and put the implant in that uh, and kind of leave the other ear just uh, as it is to kind of um, work with whatever residual hearing is in uh, that part of the system. Um, and so one, I suppose a justification for this is, well, they can leave the other ear unperturbed in case like there's a better system that comes along sometime in the future or better technology they can use that ear to uh, work with in terms of the another implant or something like that. Um, the funny part of this is though, that you have two ears for a reason, right? So you have two ears so you can localize where sounds are coming from in the world because the sound waves will reach your ears at slightly different times. And then there's actually a module in your brain which figures out where those sounds came from based on the sort of phase shift and when they appear in your ears. Um, so I normally do this in class, but uh, whatever. I have you know, a vitamin C bottle. Yeah, I can figure out it came from right back there. Uh, that's where the sound happened. I didn't see it land. Um, but my mind will be able to tell me that based on when the sound waves come into uh, my two ears. If I only have one ear, I can't really do that, it turns out. So just having one cochlear implant really doesn't give you that ability. So even at that level, it becomes a little bit difficult to use um, cochlear implants. Uh, so that may be another justification for using two in the future rather than one. But um, I'm not really going to get into that at the moment because, like I said, it's expensive and there are other considerations to uh, other factors to consider. Uh, beyond environmental sounds, um, you can get speech out of it. Maybe that's like the next level up. Uh, it's difficult to do things like speaking on a telephone, although telephones have gotten better, or at least, you know, if you talk on Skype, it's basically the same quality of speech. So uh, that might not be as much of an issue anymore. Uh, music is, however, really bad. It's hard to get. Um, a good feeling of what music is doing when you're using a cochlear implant, although some people can still get that. But um, evidently it's not as much fun as it used to be uh, if you are a CI user. Um, so for congenitally deaf, congenitally deaf users, I'll just fix the little misspelling here, uh, the cochlear implant can provide an unusual test of the so-called forbidden experiment. So I don't know if you guys know about this either, uh, but the forbidden experiment is an experiment which officially has never been done, but the idea is that you could, in theory, take a kid who has no language and sort of put them in isolation and see if they acquire language uh, without any sort of external input as if the language is, you know, born in them. Um, and we know there are these various innateness hypotheses about where language comes from, but basically none of them say you will never acquire you will ever acquire language without some external input you kind of have to get something to uh some sort of external structure to get the system the innate part of the system kick-started um according to legend uh in ancient times there was some king uh sametikos i believe this is from like greek history who uh who tried this experiment and so he had kids a kid placed in a room from birth and then he had um, deaf mute servants just serve the kid until the kid was loud enough to start speaking or loud enough, old enough to start speaking. Uh, and then eventually one day the kid said the word bekos, which apparently is the Phrygian word for bread. And so the whole point of this experiment, according to legend, was to find out what the original language was. So apparently the original language is Phrygian but um, I'm not sure if that study has been peer reviewed, so don't quote me on that. Um, there have been other like weird people, I guess you could say, but I mean, if you're a linguist, you're kind of weird to begin with, let's be honest. Uh, so if <laughs> there was a linguist, uh, and I think he's still around, still working by the name of Derek Bickerton, uh, who wanted to try this experiment, kind of Lord of the Fly style, by putting little kids on an island in the Pacific somewhere. So he, this guy worked at, at the University of Hawaii to begin with. Uh, and then he wanted to find some island to try to do this experiment. I don't know why exactly, but um, 
I think he was kind of interested in Creoles actually to see if like kids would start speaking some sort of language which had the same features as Creoles, but um, or pigeons. Um, and he wanted to do this like in the 90s uh, and never got off the ground for obvious reasons because no ethics board would approve that. Um, but the idea is still like out there floating in some people's heads. Uh, and one way to kind of do it is to simply work with what um, people who are born deaf do or look at what they do when they start to acquire language. So uh, if a kid is born deaf and then like some years later it gets a cochlear implant and starts to hear, like how do they acquire language? Does it look the same as the way other kids acquire language? Uh, and of course it's, um, you know, uh, gonna be different just because their experience is different. One hypothesis about the uh, acquisition, acquisition of language is that there is a critical period, uh, like around the time that uh, kids start to go through puberty, like around the age of 12 or 13, where beyond that, if they haven't gotten language already, they will never get language. Um, so obviously you want a kid to have language input as early as possible for them to prosper and live happily in life. Uh, and you definitely don't want to deprive them of language until they're like 18 or something like that. Uh, so nobody's again ever going to do that experiment intentionally. Uh, but if somebody is born deaf and has minimal um, kind of outside uh, language contact with other people who can't communicate them without spoken language, then they could go for a very long time without um, developing language. Uh, so that's one sense of the critical period. Uh, another sense of the critical period is like how early does a kid need to get um, hearing in order to be able to use a system like the cochlear implant very well. Um, and they found out through studies that uh, infants who get cochlear implants perform better with them the earlier they receive the implant. So there's not like some strict dividing line between when they can like get a good sense of hearing versus when it um, drops off to nothing. Uh, but instead, the earlier, the better, which is kind of, you know, common sense uh, if you're not committed to some sort of theoretical ideology about this. So uh, normally speaking, they don't implant kids with cochlear implants before they're 12 months old, just to give their, um, I guess, their skulls and their um, a bit of time to develop. Uh, they, one of the amazing things about this though, is that, uh, so as you know, your skull gets bigger as you get older, which is one of the like wondrous things about human development is how you can kind of keep your skull shape as it gets bigger, uh, when you grow up, uh, but your cochlea does not get bigger. Uh, that's the same size the whole, whole way. Uh, so you can implant, um, one of these devices very young. Uh, and then the earlier you get it, the better you do, but there's a steady drop off in performance as a kid gets older. Um, so I had uh, a colleague in Indiana who uh, would, I had a couple colleagues who would operate on children this young and then other colleagues who would study how well the children would do. Uh, and so they kind of have provided the foundation for this research, uh, determining that kids do better the younger they are when they get a cochlear implant. It's an issue um, sort of ethically as well. So there is, uh, as I hope you know, a uh, strong and proud deaf culture uh, in the world uh, by uh, deaf um, speakers of whatever language. If they have sign language, um, there's a general pride that they have in that as sort of a distinct culture that they wanna be able to preserve with the unique features that they're proud of uh, and often wanna to transmit to their children. Um, so deaf or sort of, I guess, um, the deaf community often when they have a deaf child, uh, looks to that child and say they want to kind of sort of keep the culture going and not necessarily give that child a cochlear implant and therefore might resist um, the um, attempts by the medical community or whoever to give a child an implant um, when they're so young until they can kind of make a decision for about it for themselves. Uh, hearing parents who have a deaf child are probably be more likely to want the child to get a cochlear implant to kind of give them a normal hearing life uh, as they grow older, as much of that as possible. Um, so there's a bit of a uh, cultural conflict that goes on there, which makes it awkward that the fact that um, kids will do better with these implants before they're even able to make their own decisions about it. So you can't really wait that long um, as a parent. Um, it's still difficult to achieve natural levels of fluency in speech, although I have definitely heard uh, kids who gotten these implants young who sound like more or less normal. Uh, so it's possible, but not a given. It depends on how much uh, a user can use the implant. So one of the fun things about these uh, implants is that you can kind of uh, 
turn reality off and on by simply stopping, no longer using the implant and you won't hear anything. It's kind of like hitting the mute button on, on Zoom, as it were. Um, yeah, sometimes I think it would be fun to have a mute button for myself in real life, but that's not going to happen. Uh, anyways, partially this can be affected by early sensory deprivation if you don't get um, a lot of input when you're very young. It can take your mind a while to sort of adjust to the um, uh, a reincursion of that input um, or learning how to deal with um, auditory signals once it starts to get them if it's not something that it's been using ever since uh, birth. Uh, also, there's the problem that the auditory signal is simply degraded. It doesn't have as much information as um, we get as normal hearing listeners. So a CI user has to sort of overcome that challenge as well. Uh, it's largely unknown uh, if somebody hasn't had a cochlear implant and have gone deaf or they've been deaf for a long time. <clears throat> it's not easy to predict how well they will do with it once they receive it. Uh, people have looked at different predictors about how well they might do. So they think that maybe uh, lip reading ability is one way to um, predict uh, whether or not a listener will do well with the implant because they already have sort of this ability to get information, speech information from the visual domain. And then maybe the cochlear implant can kind of just complement that. So the better lip reading ability you have, maybe the better you will do with the cochlear implant. Um, People have looked at like fMRI scan, scans of brain activity to see like how much of the auditory cortex is still activating when people hear sound, even if they're deaf. Uh, and maybe the more fMRI activity you can see, the better the listener will do with the implant because it's still kind of there for them to work with. Uh, like I said, your brain can start to reorganize a bit if you lose the uh, ability to hear. And those portions of your brain can be taken over by other um, functions uh, over time. Uh, speaking of the auditory cortex, I will leave you with one last auditory thought, <clears throat> which is that not only does your cochlea um, create a Fourier transform, as it were, a frequency-based um, transformation of the sounds you hear, uh, but that sort of conversion of different frequencies um, in complex sounds uh, goes all the way up to your auditory cortex. So there are different portions of your auditory cortex which are devoted to different frequencies of sounds that you might hear in speech or in other sounds. Uh, so there's like a 500 hertz cortex and a 1000 hertz cortex and so on and so forth. Um, there's also different neurons in your brain which only fire when sounds change. As we know, uh, changes in sound are really important to understanding speech or just perceiving speech as speech in general. That's why we look at speech in spectrogram form so we can see those changes a little bit better. So your brain is um, tuned to different frequencies and it's kind of customized to uh, understanding or to being receptive to the sorts of features of speech that um, make speech unique. Uh, and I'm not going to go back to the motor theory um, lecture again, but there's sort of an auditory foundation for the idea that um, our brains are specialized for perceiving um, human language and speech. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a lot of cool things in the brain uh, to look at. We're, this is only scratching the surface, so I'd recommend you take um, more uh, classes in uh, neuroscience if you have any inclin or inclination towards doing that to begin with. I'm going to stop talking before I ramble on too long because uh, I don't really have any light left anymore. There's a comment out there. I want to go see if I can see it. So I'm going to stop now and see you guys next time for an exemplar theory lecture. All right. <laughs>